Okay, now we have finished the first point in pharmacokinetics, which was absorption. But before talking about our second topic in pharmacokinetics, which is distribution, let's first remember what was bioavailability. Remember bioavailability? Yes, it was the fraction of the drug that reaches the systemic circulation. And now let's see how that is calculated. Here we can see a graph between time and the plasma concentration of the drug. The curve we see here is for a drug given through the oral route. And as you can see here, the drug concentration in plasma increases slowly because there is a time for absorption. Then the drug reaches a maximum concentration in the blood here. Then the concentration declines due to the elimination. This curve here is for a drug given by the intravenous route. As you can see, there is no absorption phase. All the dose taken reaches the systemic circulation. And then the concentration starts to decline due to elimination. For both curves, this area here and here, is called the area under the curve or the AUC. So we have AUC for the IV route and the AUC for the oral route. For calculating the bioavailability of any route, the AUC of this route is divided by the AUC of the IV route and then multiplied by 100. Why do we divide by the AUC of the IV root? Exactly, because it equals 100%. Now we will move to another point to discuss, which is the roots of administration. We can divide the roots of administration into intra roots. And the word intral means related to the GIT and roots that are not intral, not related to the GIT. So these roots, which are not intral, we call it parintral. Or simply, these are the roots of injection. First, what are the intral roots? Number one, the oral route, in which our drugs are taken in the form of tablets or capsules. And the main disadvantage of this route is the first pass metabolism, which decreases the bioavailability of the drug as we learned before. Second route is the sublingual route in which you take a small pill under the tongue. This route bypasses the ferrous pass metabolism. So it has a higher bioavailability than that of the oral route. And an example for this drug is nitroglycerin, a drug that is used to treat angina pectoris. And we will discuss that later on. Third route is the rectal one, in which drugs are taken in the form of suppositories. There are three veins drain this area. The superior rectal vein, the inferior rectal vein, and the middle rectal vein. The superior rectal vein drain via the portal system. So, its blood goes to 
the liver. While middle and inferior veins bypass the liver and, and the blood is delivered directly to the systemic circulation. Then we can say that this root is two thirds systemic. Part of it bypasses the liver and hence the ferrous pass metabolism. In the parental root of administration, we have the intravenous root. By the way, we forgot to say that rectal root is important if we have vomiting. It is better than the oral root if, if we have a vomiting because we are not swallowing the, the drug. Okay? Now, for the parenteral root, we have number one, the IV root and the intramuscular and the subcutaneous injection. For the IV root, we had learned before that this root has 100% bioavailability, also that no absorption occurs in this root. And in this root, this is no ferrous pass metabolism. Okay, we now will start discussing distribution. First of all, how much of our body is fluids? It is 60% of our body weight. 60% of our body weight is water. So, for a 70 kilogram individual, there is 42 liters of water. Now, let's see how is this water or fluids are distributed. Let's see. Assume this is a tissue in your body. This is a tissue in your body consisting of these cells. This tissue gets oxygenated blood through the arteries and there is a vein that carries away its deoxygenated blood. Of these 42 liters, plasma volume is about 4 liters. Now this is our cells. The fluid that fills the space between them is called the interstitial fluid. This fluid is about 10 liters. So we now have 10 liters of interstitial fluid and 4 liters of plasma. So the total is 14 liters. The rest, which is 28 liters is the intracellular fluid. This is uh, the fluid inside the cells. And by logic, it should be the largest volume of all the body fluids because simply our body is composed of cells. The interstitial fluid and plasma are both the fluids found outside the cells. So they are together called extracellular fluid. So again, 60% of our body weight is water. So for a 70 kilogram individual, it's 42 liters of water in body. These are divided in Plasma, 4 liters, interstitial fluid, which is the fluid between cells, 10 liters, so total they are 14 liters, and this fluid 
is the fluid outside cells. So it's called extracellular fluid. And it is 14 liters. The rest of the 42 liters is 28 liters, which is inside the cell. And it's called intracellular fluid. Okay, this tiny blood vessels here is called the blood capillaries. These are the blood vessels between artery and veins. Also, there are other small diameter blood vessels here that branch out from arteries. These blood vessels are called arterioles. And these here small blood vessels are called venules. So we have artery, then arterioles, then blood capillaries, then venules, then vein. And the blood capillaries are the smallest blood vessels in the body. And they convey blood between the arterioles and the venules. And these micro vessels, the blood capillaries, are the site of exchange of many substances with the interstitial fluid surrounding them, such as glucose, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. Right now, talking about our drug, about our drug distribution, let's see how drugs are distributed between these different compartments of fluid. We are talking about three compartments intracellular fluid, interstitial fluid, and the plasma. Let's see how our drug is distributed between these compartments. We would take this section here, which is the blood capillary and this interstitial fluid and the cell. And we, en we will enlarge this section. Okay, let's see. Suppose that we have our drug here flowing in the lumen of the blood capillary. And now it has to pass to the interstitial fluid. So it can act on the cells. We have our drug here in the lumen of capillary that must pass to the interstitial fluid. So it can go to the cells or act on the cells. The drug has, has to pass through cells in the wall of the capillary. These cells are called the endothelial cells. These cells are enveloped by a membrane composed of proteins. This membrane is called bismuth membrane. So again, our drug is now flowing in the lumen of capillary. To pass to the interstitial fluid so it can go to the cells, it has to pass through endothelial cells. These cells are in the wall of the capillary. And there, there is an, a membrane that is composed of proteins and this membrane envelops these endothelial cells, and this membrane is called bismuth membrane. This, the, this section here differs according to the tissue. This section here differs according to the tissue, and this would affect how the drug is distributed in this tissue. 
let's have a look here we can see that there are no spaces between adjacent endothelial cells there are tight junctions between these cells they are fused tightly together and this would for sure restrict the diffusion of substance in the capillary to the interstitium so for a drug there is no spaces between the endothelial cells where the drug can pass through them and the only way for this drug to pass to the interstitium is by diffusion through the cells not between them so our drug must be what in its nature yes it must be lipophilic so it can pass through the membrane or the cell membrane of endothelial cells okay so in what tissue do you expect we can observe this type of endothelium yes this is in the brain and this assembly of endothelial cells this is what we call the blood brain barrier but wait a second only lipophilic substance pass to the brain only lipophilic ones so what is about glucose it is the primary energy transport for the brain but it, it's not lipophilic glucose is water soluble how would it pass to the brain can you remember facilitated diffusion it was a diffusion along with concentration gradient but it was facilitated by carrying this what occurs with glucose in brain it is transported through carriers or transporters called glucose transporters or glute so for a drug to pass through the endothelial cells of the brain it must be either lipophilic so it can passively diffuse through the cell membrane of the endothelial cells or it has a carrier or a transporter on the endothelial cells and that was the first type of endothelial cells let's have a look on the second type of the endothelial cells here we can see that these are or there are spaces between the endothelial cells we call that spaces fenestrations and through this, these spaces water soluble molecules can pass by, but they should be somehow small enough to pass through these fenestrations so proteins for example can pass or if a drug bound to a protein also can pass a drug bound to protein can you remember yes the plasma proteins if a drug bound to a plasma proteins like albumin it can pass through these spaces okay where can we find this type of endothelial cells they are in the kidney and that is the reason there are fenestrations in the endothelial cells of the kidney capillaries they are not large enough to allow the proteins to pass 
so we don't find proteins in urine and if any pathology occurs here we then see proteins in urine so we know our kidney is injured so it should be noted that a drug bound to plasma proteins don't pass here from the blood to the interstitium of the kidney that means that a drug to be excreted it should be free and not bound to plasma proteins okay now let's take a look at the last type of the endothelial cells okay here we can see clearly that the spaces between endothelial cells are very big it seems that anything can pass easily from or between these cells even proteins can pass where can we find the type of this endothelial cell this in in the liver and spleen and that seems logic liver is the organ of metabolism and then detoxification we want every substance in the blood to pass easily to the interstitial of liver so it can go to the hepatic cells also this organ the liver is the one that synthesizes the plasma proteins and secretes them into the blood so it makes sense that the plasma protein can pass through the endothelial cells of its capillaries okay so in these capillaries even plasma protein can pass all right okay then after we had learned about the different structures of endothelium of the blood vessels and how it affects the distribution of the drug let's take a look at factors affecting distribution Number one, the blood flow, as it affected the absorption of the drugs, making it more at a small intestine, it would be a factor for distribution also. So distribution to highly perfused tissues, such as brain, liver, and kidney, is better than tissues that have poor perfusion, such as skin, skeletal muscles, and adipose tissue. Second factor is the blood capillary permeability and the drug structure, and we have discussed this point already. The third factor is binding to plasma proteins, and as we have known, the free form is the active one that can have effect on our cells. It is also the form liable for metabolism and the excretion while the bound form is not liable for that not before it leaves the plasma protein and become free okay now we will discuss our last topic and distribution which is called the volume of distribution or the vd Okay, uh, suppose that we have two beakers here, and in these two beakers we have unknown volume of water. We know that this beaker has more volume than of that beaker here on the right. 
but we don't know exactly what is the the volume of the water in these two beakers and so to measure the volume of the water in these two beakers we dissolved 100 milligram of a colored substance in both beakers then we took one milliliter from each beaker and we measured the concentration of this substance in it okay what is the concentration it is the amount of this substance dissolved by the volume of the fluid it is dissolved in it. And as we can see now, the solution in the beaker on the left looks diluted, while in this beaker it looks concentrated. And that's because the volume of water on the beaker on the left is more than that of a beaker on the right and by looking at the equation of concentration we can find that volume is inversely proportional to concentration so the solution in the beaker on the left has less concentration than the beaker on the right although they have the same amount of substance the 100 milligrams because the volume here is bigger than the volume here all right okay suppose that we measured the concentration in the beaker on the left and we found it to be one milligram per milliliter and the, in the beaker on the right it's 3 milligram per milli. So here there is 1 milligram of our substance per 1 milli. So how milli are there for the whole 100 milligram? This is a simple cross multiplication, and here we have. 100 ml of water in the other beaker there is 3 mg per 1 ml and by by the same cross multiplication we would find that we have 33.33 ml of water so the water here is more than the water here so this is more, sorry, less concentrated than the solution in this big. And by this, this is same idea we had discussed, we can measure the volume of fluid in which our drug is distributed. How can we do this? We give a known amount of the drug. Then shortly, we take a blood sample and then we measure the concentration in this sample. And by dividing the amount of the drug we give by the concentration in plasma, which we measured shortly after giving the drug, then we can measure the volume of distribution but wait a minute there is a problem in measuring volume of distribution that way look at these two beakers what if our colored substance isn't uniformly distributed in water suppose that for example in this beaker on the left if our substance settled here, sorry, settled at the bottom of the beaker, and we took the one milli sample in which we measured the concentration, we took it from the bottom of the beaker. Since our, 
or our substance settled here at the bottom means it is concentrated deep. So we, when we measure the concentration, we would find it very high. And that would result in getting small volume when, calcula when calculated. Despite the volume of the water in this beaker is large. But because our substance settled at the bottom, it gave us a false high concentration. So we got a false value for the volume of the water in the beaker. And the same can go in this beaker. Suppose that in this beaker on the right, our substance floated, floated on the top of the water. And we again took the sample, our one milli from the bottom of the beaker. We would get a very low concentration. And hence, a large volume of water, which is also a not a true value. These false values we can also get when measuring the volume of the distribution of a drug. Because our drug isn't also uniformly distributed in our body flow. For example, it may be concentrated inside tissues. That means it is found mainly in the compartment of intracellular fluid. Remember that the only fluid compartment we can measure the concentration of the drug in it is the plasma compartment. So when we measure the drug which is retained in our cells, we would expect that it would have low concentration in plasma. It's not uniformly distributed in our body flow. So when we calculate the volume of distribution of a drug that is concentrated inside cells, we would find its value to be large because the concentration is low. And this value could reach in some cases, for example, 500 liters or even more. Is that logic by any means? that the volume of our body flow is to be 500 liters. For sure, no. So we better call that volume of distribution apparent volume of distribution. Because it's not a true value. Because our drug is not uniformly distributed in body tissue. Sorry, in body flow. But despite the value of volume of distribution isn't real and it, and it is apparent, it gives us indication about how our drug is distributed. So, if a drug has large volume of distribution, that means its concentration in plasma is small. So, this drug could pass our tissue cells and it's concentrated there. This drug could pass cell membranes easily. It's now concentrated in our tissues. And on the other side, a drug with a small volume of distribution has a larger concentration in plasma and it's, it's concentrated more in plasma, not on in the tissues. Okay, would the drug, this drug with high VD expected to be highly bound on plasma proteins or not? For sure, no. If it was highly bound, it wouldn't be free to pass to the tissues. So, 
a drug with a high VD is sequestered in tissues and not highly bound to plasma proteins. Okay, what about the eligibility of this high VD drug for hemodialysis? Hemodialysis is a process done to kidney patients to remove the waste from their blood. So, if we got a toxicity from a particular drug, we can do this hemodialysis to remove this drug from the blood. So, would this process be beneficial for the treatment of toxicity of a drug with large VD? For sure, no. Hemodialysis is for the removal of the drug from the blood. The drug concentration in blood is very small. It is sequestered in tissues. So, hemodialysis wouldn't be beneficial in that case. Okay. Again, what about what about the half life of this large VD drug? Would would you expect the half life to be large or small? Half life or T half is the time required for a drug to reduce to half of its initial value. And now this is drug is sequestered in tissue. So it would be expected that it would take longer time to reduce in its amount because it is sequestered in tissues so we would expect a large T half now let's have a look on, on drugs with low VD this drug these drugs would have a small T half they would be found mainly in the plasma compartment, so they are highly bound to plasma proteins and they are eligible for hemodialysis to treat toxicity. Now, we had finished our second topic in pharmacokinetics, which is distribution. Let's start discussing metabolism or what we have called biotransformation.